uh, who will speak about torsion points on feminist of Indian varieties. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. I'm sorry I can't be, uh, I couldn't make it to Toronto personally. Um, I will speak about applications uh, of minimal geometry to problems in number theory and, and Diophantine geometry. And so my talk will be about abelian varieties and torsion points distributed on abelian varieties. So I will speak about joint work in progress with Xiang Gao from Hanover. <clears throat> so the, the basic notation or setup of this talk is as follows. Um, my, the object of interest to start out with would be an abelian variety of uh, dimension G over the field of complex numbers. So you can think of the abelian variety in a, in a manner of different ways. For example, you can think of it as, as a complex torus. So it's structure, if you look at the complex points, this will be a, a Lie group, a compact Lie group. And as such, it's um, biholomorphic to this complex torus where uh, the lattice, the period lattice omega here is a three abelian subgroup of C to the G of rank 2G of maximal possible rank. So if you forget about the complex structure, and this is a point of view that we're gonna take later on in the, in the talk. If you forget about the complex structure, uh, the abelian variety as a real analytic group becomes uh, isomorphic to a torus of dimension 2G. So whereas here in the complex setting, we have the period lattice, which also determines the complex structure, there is no additional structure here in the real analytic world. So the only invariant of the abelian variety here would be its dimension, because they would all be isomorphic. So but from the group theoretic point of view, um, <clears throat> the structure of an abelian variety is quite simple. So it's, it's uh, a commutative group and that the points of finite order, if you look at the abelian variety from this point of view, from the real analytic point of view, would just be represented by um, equivalence classes of rational vectors of, of length 2G. And if you look at it from the point of view of a complex torus, you're just looking at rational linear combinations of, of a basis of this uh, period um, lattice. So the, the torsion group here can be described quite explicitly and from the topological point of view, what you can tell immediately is that the torsion group is, is dense in any uh, reasonable topology or the, the, the two topologies that we have here. First of all, it's dense in the Euclidean topology. And second of all, it's dense in the Zariski topology. Of course, an abelian variety itself is an algebraic variety. So the Zariski topology makes sense here. Okay, so the main theorem at the start of this talk, we we'll go back to uh, Renault from the 1980s. It's the, the Money Montfort conjecture. And it, the conjecture essentially asks, what can you say about subvarieties of an abelian variety? So this would be an algebraic subvariety that contains a Zariski dense set of points of finite order. So in other words, such that the, the torsion points of A lies a risky dense uh, on X. And the, the theorem, well, it's, it was a conjecture. Um, sometimes called the Mann Munford conjecture, proved by Reynolds that says that if the torsion points are as a risky dense, then there has to be some good reason for that. And the reason is that the original variety we started out with is the translate of an abelian subvariety B by a point of finite order. As you recall on the last slide, we saw that the torsion points are dense in the Zariski topology on an abelian variety. And the same is true if I look at an abelian subvariety and translate it by a point of finite order. So the converse of this statement is, is true as well. And um, in a sense, um, this characterizes the subvarieties that contain as a risky dense set of points of finite order. So this proof or this theorem has many different proofs. I've listed um, several authors down here, uh, Hujovsky, Pink, Russler, uh, Pila Zanya, who we'll hear about more later on, or Tatsi Hindri, they gave proofs, um, different proofs of this theorem. And they're also quantitative versions by, for example, Bombieri Zanya. Uh, more recently, Galato, Martinez, Cuyde, Lars Cuyde, Galremo. So um, 
we're going to look at a bit more closely the Pilazani approach because this is um, a, a result that introduced ominable geometry to this field, in, in particular also the, the Pila Loki counting theorem. So this was a uh, an important paper giving a new proof of the mind monetary conjecture that opened up a lot of uh, avenues to um, different parts um, of diaphantine geometry. So let me give you an example of what happens when instead of looking at a single abelian variety, we look at a family of abelian varieties, because that was the part of the title of my talk, families of abelian varieties. So the first case to look at would be families of elliptic curves, because those are the, um, you know, the one-dimensional abelian varieties. And so you can write down a nice family of elliptic curves, the so-called Legendre family. And um, you can see the cubic here, a non-singular cubic defines an elliptic curve together with a point. And we have an addition of parameter lambda that comes from uh, the projective line minus three points. And so we, we choose lambda p naught equals zero and one in order to, to guarantee that this right-hand side here is square free. And so that we really have a non-singular cubic um, and this three-pointed um, punctured projective line is sometimes also called the modular curve curve by two. So this the, each lambda gives me an elliptic curve like this, and conversely, every elliptic curve over C appears up to isomorphism in this form here for some non-unique lambda in general. And <clears throat> so, if we let lambda vary, we're letting lambda vary over this curve. We let, um, well, x, y, z are projective coordinates. So we can think of them as projective coordinates on P2. We get a surface in P2 cross Y2. And the surface lies above the, um, it lies above the curve Y2. Because I can just project down onto the coordinate determined by lambda. And this is, um, would be an example of an elliptic surface or a family of abelian varieties because each fiber is itself an elliptic curve. And as I vary the fiber downstairs, I get a, like a family, an algebraic family of elliptic curves. So this would be the notation that we'll use in the talk will just be E lambda will be a single fiber here. Now, the thing to remember about this family is that this is no longer a group because if I have different, different fibers here, if I take a second fiber, then there's no way to reasonably add points in two different fibers. So this is no longer a group. I can only add points in, in, a, in a fixed fiber, in a single fiber. But what I can look at is I can look at the torsion of uh, this family of elliptic curve. So, so that will just be the union of all torsion subgroups as I let lambda vary across the base. So that will give me a subset of this of this surface, this elliptic surface, which would not be a subgroup, of course, because we don't have an ambient group to start to start out with. So this is kind of the the um, the relative version of the torsion at points on the Bellin variety. So let me know if you have any if you have any questions. <clears throat> so then the natural thing maybe you could ask is, given a curve in this family of elliptic curve. So E is, is a surface and inside this surface, we have a curve. Can we expect the curve to intersect the torsion in a finite set? And the answer is actually always no. So there's never finiteness. So finiteness in the curve setting would correspond to the risky non-denseness. So for example, if you, could, if you start out with the curve, if you look at this curve here, so remember we're in the Legendre family, lambda is a parameter, and a point of this nature here sa solves the Legendre um, equation. And <clears throat> the fact that the y coordinate is zero means that this point here has order precisely two. So if I look at this, this curve here, call it C, then every point on this curve has torsion order two. So it's somehow generically a point, the curve is, is it's completely a torsion curve. So it cannot be the case that there are only finitely many torsion points on this curve because actually all points on this curve are torsion. <clears throat> but what happens if this is not the case? So this is also, you even get infinite 
many torsion points if, 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 if the curve is not constant torsion in the first sense. So if you take any curve in this family of elliptic curves, then um, you can show that it meets the torsion, um, torsion set in an infinite number of points. So the first thing you, there, there are essentially two cases. So the first case was already covered in the first example. So we look at E square bracket N and E square bracket N is just the set of points on the family such that N times P equals zero. So we're not allowed to add points on the, the family, but we can multiply a single point because we're staying on the same time. So this is somehow the kernel of multiplication by N. And if the curve happens to lie, if the test curve happens to lie inside E of N, then we're kind of in this situation, we get infinite many torsion points. That's this one here. Otherwise, if the curve is not contained in, in any of the E of Ns, Then this was observed by Nasser Zanye that um, <clears throat> that for all large enough n, the curve will meet the n torsion points. I'll give you a heuristic explanation on the next slide. So if you let n vary, for example, over the primes, um, and you can show that you can see that this implies that you have infinite many points here. So you have to be a bit careful. Um, you actually get something slightly stronger here that this is not just a zero point. And it's not empty. Okay, so we have infinite many torsion points on C in general. So the first finiteness result in this direction is due to mass Zanya that I've already mentioned before. And the point is you shouldn't just look at a single point um, but you have to somehow look at two points. And I'll, I'll explain what this means geometrically. So instead of asking that a single point, a curve is, is, meets a torsion point, we essentially introduce a second coordinate. So the theorem, what they prove is that <clears throat> you're looking at the set of lambdas such that the point with uh, x coordinate two is torsion and in addition, the point with x coordinate three is torsion. So you have a second condition on lambda. And what we're looking at here from the geometric point of view is a curve C, not inside the Legendre family of elliptic curves, but inside the fibered square of the Legendre family, because we have two coordinates. And each of these kind of multi-sections corresponds to one factor in here. So if you look at it from a just from a pure dimensional point of view. So the curve that is determined by the theorem of, um, well, Master Zanya, of course it has dimension one. And the curve lives inside this fibered square of the Legendre family. And the fibered square of the Legendre family has dimension three. Right, I, I already wrote it down here. But the thing that we're intersecting with here, namely this, the set of all points, for example, that have order dividing n, this is a curve. So we're intersecting two curves in something three-dimensional. And so any non-empty intersection here would be, could be considered unlikely because if you're, you have two lines or two, two curves in three-dimensional space, you wouldn't expect them to intersect. So any intersection here is unlikely. And for this reason, it makes sense to look at, or it's actually necessary to look at these two conditions at the same time. And let me also point out that Stoll, he made this result completely explicit. He showed that there are actually no lambda that satisfy these two conditions simultaneously. However, the, the methods that, that Master and Zani introduced um, generalize quite well to, to other families, um, other curves and other families in the building products. So all of this fits into some general framework by um, conjecture of pink which I'll just briefly explain in the special case that is required for this talk. So Ping's conjecture doesn't con just work with the Legendre family of elliptic curves, but rather with any family of abelian varieties, um, A over S, where S is some base variety. And uh, if, to keep things, oops. <clears throat> 
So we'll, we'll just assume that S is, is some variety. It doesn't have to be a curve. It's some smooth projective or quasi-projective variety defined over the complex numbers. So there are many. We'll see more examples later on. And so each fiber <clears throat> above a point in S is an abelian variety. And as such, there's a, a subgroup of points of finite order. And then the full torsion group is just the, it's not a group, sorry. The full torsion set is the union of all fiber-wise torsion sets. And there's another way to look at this, the one, the point of view I took on the previous slide, we look at the, the kernel of multiplication by N on the family. Um, so this would be a, a, a countable infinite union of algebraic subsets. So this is a torsion set. And so the, the, the dimension analysis works much the same as before. So if I have a sub variety of this family of abelian varieties now, and <clears throat> I want to make sure, I want to find a condition such that this condition here is unlikely. So it's unlikely to have um, a point on X meet um, the kernel of multiplication by N. And being um, unlikely somehow, the heuristics is that we have, that the sum of the dimensions of X and whatever we're intersecting with is less than the dimension of the ambient space. Before it was one plus one is less than three. And here we can compute the dimension of the, um, the kernel of multiplication by n, that's nothing other than the relative, um, sorry, that's nothing other than the dimension of s. Right, because of, above each point in s, we have a finite number of points of order, div, uh, points of finite order dividing n. So this is dimension s. And then the condition that we have here is um, equivalent to say that the dimension of X is less than the relative dimension of the abelian scheme. So that's the dimension of the fibers that we have. <clears throat> right, so that's, that can, that's kind of a natural condition to impose in this problem. On the slide before we had here, um, if you recall, this was a curve and the ambient fiber dimension was two because we had a fiber-wise product of elliptic curves. <clears throat> There's another um, aspect we have to take care of because the, the first counter example I showed you before to define this was that if a section, if the curve is somehow constant torsion, and that's something you can measure on the so-called generic fiber of the Bellian variety. So the, the generic fiber of the Bellian family of the Bellian varieties is itself an Bellian variety, but defined over some function field. Right. So the, the point is that if, if our family here on the generic fiber of the base, the generic fiber, is containing a proper algebraic subgroup of the generic fiber of the Bellion family, then essentially what happened is, is that X is contained in a smaller family of abelian varieties. And um, in order to not be able to cheat around this condition here, we have to rule out that this is the case. Otherwise, then it's somehow in a sense, trying to cheat your way around this condition here, which shouldn't be possible. So taking these two points into account, uh, there's the conjecture by Pinks is that as soon as these conditions are met, namely the dimension of X is less than the ambient, uh, the, the relative dimension of the family. And generically, X is not containing a proper algebraic subgroup, then X will meet the torsion in a non zero risky dense subset of X. In the curve case, of course, we could write finiteness here. So I, to make it, um, to, there's a, a small technical point here. We have to assume that this is geometrically irreducible. So this is for a family of abelian varieties, the conjecture. And you can even formulate a conjecture for semi-abelian varieties. And um, you have to be a bit careful here uh, because they're so-called uh, unexpected special sub-varieties uh, as found out by Bertrand and then worked out together with uh, Eddie Hoven. So there's some more care you need to take if you want to uh, work with semi-abelian varieties. Okay, so the first, uh, the first results towards, um, I already mentioned the first results towards this conjecture, but the first general results were then later also found by Master Zanier and then in last, um, one of the most recent papers together also with Corvaya, where um, they no, no longer deal with uh, the Legendre family of elliptic curves, but rather with the more general um, family of abelian surfaces. 
So A here is um, a general family of abelian surfaces where the base is again a curve. And the object we're intersecting with, we want to test is again also a curve. So in order for the, um, so the dimension condition here is met because one is less than two. Here G is, G is two here in this theorem and dim X is one. And then we also have the, the, um, the condition that the curve is not generically um, in a proper algebraic subgroup. Uh, then the conclusion here is um, what exactly what the conjecture expects, namely that the curve meets only finitely many torsion points where it's fibrous. So here, non zariski denseness, but um, of course, in the curve case, that just means finiteness. All right. <clears throat> so it's one other aspect here is that really this holds for the, the base the base field here is the field of complex numbers. That's, um, that's the, the, the natural, the natural um, generality of these kind of results. Let me move on. Okay, so the, the result I want to talk about, which is um, work in progress with, with Xiang Gao, is um, this, um, this conjecture of, of pink first uh, in, the, in the case where everything is defined over Q bar. So Q bar, the field of algebraic numbers here. Um, <clears throat> the family is the family of a, is a family of abelian varieties, of G-dimensional abelian varieties, and um, our X here is um, well again as before a sub variety of A. And um, to make things well, this was a hypothesis we had before to make the generic fiber make sense. Um, this is a typo. Sorry, this should be X. X has to um, dominate the base. Then we have the dimension condition here. The dimension of X is less than G. And uh, the, gener the non-generic, the, not, the thing is not generically already in, in some proper uh, algebraic subgroup of, of A. And then the conclusion is as in the conjecture that we only have like, is a risky non-dense set of torsion points contained in X. All right, so the, the proof here, I mean, the general strategy was already laid out by Master and Zanya in 2008, um, and then developed in, in, their, in their work. So it goes via the, the, essentially what is sometimes also called the P. Lasagna point counting strategy. And it combines, combines several um, different tools. So if you've heard about this strategy before, first of all, you need to somehow um, be able to reformulate your problem in terms of um, a definable set in some minimal structure. And then you need um, a Galois orbit lower bound. And that's what essentially happens here in um, step one. So this will require um, a, something called a height upper bound that was proved uh, by Dimitrov, Gao, and myself. And this generalizes older work to some extent, you can say it generalizes older work of Silverman, which was a tool that um, Master Zanya used in, in their work for the, the one parameter case. Then uh, there's the, um, the functional transcend, transcendence aspect of the, the proof. So for this, we use um, so-called Axe-Shanwell theorem for the universal family of abelian varieties, sometimes also called the weak mixed Axe-Shanwell theorem. This is a result by, by Gao and um, some extends older work of Mock, Pila, Zimmermann. Um, the third step I already mentioned, so we need to put everything into a no minimal framework. And for this, we need definability results uh, of Peter Zill and Starchenko. And then to count the rational points, we need a variant of the pila wilkie counting theorem. And then combining everything together is somehow um, how, this, how this proof works. And it's somehow the original strategy already is by Pila and Zanya in their approach towards Miley Mumford and also in, in a lot of different um, other results in dive fountain geometry, say in the last 15 years. This is a very powerful, powerful technique. So let me give you some more details on how this works in this particular setting. So <clears throat> the good thing about abelian varieties is that, well, there, there are a lot of 
families of abelian varieties, a lot of abelian varieties themselves, but there's somehow a, a particular family that's that's universal, at least for with some caveats. And um, so I want to talk about the universal family of abelian varieties. And so this family kind of, for a given dimension, it, it controls all abelian varieties of that dimension. And the basic object or one basic object is the Siegel upper half space. So if you know about Siegel upper half plane, which is responsible for the uniformization of elliptic curves in, in, in over C, there's a, something similar in, um, in higher dimension. That, that would just be the, uh, the symmetric complex matrices with positive definite imaginary part. And once you have a matrix of this nature, you can write down a period uh, lattice, which will be the period lattice of an abelian device due to um, Riemann relations. And this complex torus will be, will be an abelian variety, will be, have an algebraic structure. But different lattices will um, give the same abelian variety. And so there's a group acting here. So there's a group of symplectics, 2G two, two times 2G matrices that acts on the Siegel upper half space. And um, if you look at integral matrices, then this action will somehow transform a period lattice into another one that gives you the same abelian variety. Now there's some, there are some technicalities involved here in that if you take the right subgroup of this integral, um, SP2G integral matrix, so-called congruent subgroup that gives you the right level, then the, if you look at the, 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 the action here defined by the congruent subgroup and, and the integral lattice on, on, this, on this plane, on, on this set here, then what you get will be uh, some the, the so-called universal family of the variety. So you, it gives you also a, a canonical polarization and what is called level structure in order to make things um, work out here. So in a sense, you can think of this R to the 2G, this is kind of the direction, um, the, the, the vertical direction of the Bellian direction, and H here will give you somehow the, the horizontal direction. And modding out this, the action of this group here tells you exactly when, um, so the Abelian values become isomorphic and when our points the same. So if you just mod up, if you forget about this here, and this, if you look at R to the 2G mod Z to the 2G, you get a real torus of the right dimension. And now you get everything. Um, and it turns out that this object that we get here, this is not just anything, but it's actually um, quasi-projective variety defined over the number field. So as such, there is some immersion into some large dimensional projective space that if, if you'd like to do it, you can completely explicitly write down, at least if you, um, at the correct level, you can explicitly write down um, this immersion using some kind of theta functions. Now, the usual problem in with in here, if you want to make things definable, is that well, there's there's a lot of periodicity going on here. So this this group here is e to the two g acts by translations of r to the two g. So um, we have to somehow eliminate this periodic behavior first in order to hope to get anything that's definable in a, in a reasonable or minimal structure. So in the, the, the classical thing to look at is that there's a, well, there's a fundamental domain um, of this action here on the upper half space times R to the 2G, which is with semi-algebraic. So the, the F here is actually a fundamental domain of the, the appropriate action of the congruent subgroup on uh, C equals upper half space. And uh, in the case G equals one, if you look at the action of SL2Z on the upper half plane, which is just the positive, uh, the uh, complex numbers with positive imaginary part, then the, the usual picture that one sees is this, um, this one here. And then this F, this, this F here is in a sense, the higher dimensional version of, um, of this fundamental domain here. And then in order to get um, somehow to, to uniformize each single uh, torus, we, we, we take here um, a suitable interval. And um, 
this will be a fundamental domain for the action here. So it happens to be semi-algebraic, just as in this setting here, right? Here it's somehow just, this is a half, this is a circle, and this is fixed real part. This is real algebraic set. And um, the, the definability theorem by um, Peter Stull and Starchenko is that um, if you look at uniformizing map, which I've, well, you can look at this way here. So this is the uniformizing map, which is real analytic here because we're with R to the 2G. If you restrict it to the, to the fundamental domain here, it will become definable in the O minimal structure generated by the, the, the unrestricted exponential function and um, uh, restricted uh, analytic functions. So this is Rx was um, identified as O minimal by, by Wilkie and then Rx by O minimal. So in order to, to use this language of O minimal geometry, we need the result of Peter Sill Starchenko. And um, once we have that, we can really <clears throat> take our, any, our test sub variety X, let's just assume it's in this universal family because this will essentially determine the theorem in all other reasonable families. Once you start out with a, an X, you could just look at its pre-image under the uniformizing map. Of course, everything appropriately restricted to the fundamental domain. And then you'll get something that's um, definable in R and X. So this is just, of course, we, we are identifying here um, this as some subset of some large um, power of R here. You can identify here HG times R to the 2G as some open subset and some large power of R. This is semi algebraic. Okay, now, the, now this, this strategy that already was apparent in the proof of Money Mumford um, over 10 years ago is that if you start out with um, a point on X that happens to be torsion, then I can, I can look at what happens upstairs in the uniformization. The point lies on some abelian variety, so it has to come with some period matrix. That's, that would be the Z. And, um, there's also the part in R to the 2G, but this happens to be now a rational vector because remember our point is point of finite order, right? And the, we're somehow uniformizing each abelian variety as a, a real torus of dimension 2G. And so this Q will be a rational vector. If the order of P happens to be N, that's it's finite order N for some N, then this vector here, this Q will take on the form some integral vector P divided by N and P is uh, in D to the 2G. <clears throat> so it turns out that we, we can choose that the height of Q here is, is bounded in big O of N. So it's depending on the normalization, you can even say it's less or equal to N. So the point in the, in the family so we have a um, point on X, which is torsion. In the uniformization, it has one component that's, that's rational. The other component, this has no hope of ever being rational because it has positive definite imaginary part. So it's certainly not gonna even be a real matrix. And in general, it's not even gonna be algebraic. So this is um, the theorem of Cohen, um, Shigan, Wolfert that this would be algebraic if and only if. Um, we're in a fiber of complex multiplication, which um, is quite rare, rare here. So we can't expect this to be algebraic. This will just be some uh, matrix whose coefficients are possibly highly transcendental um, complex numbers. Right, and so the, the approach, um, the Pilazania approach was based on this idea of Pila that if we have a point here in this intersection, then we have we get for free additional points by letting the Galois group act. And this is a point where we also require that everything is defined over a number field. So starting from here, I just assume that all varieties are defined over some number field K, so Rx and uh, well, our family also. <clears throat> then if I take any Galois conjugate of P, then the Galois conjugate will still lie on X because X is defined by some equations with coefficients in K. And it will also have finite order, in fact, the same order as the original P-name order N. 
So letting this group back, the Galois group back, we get additional points. And the number of new points we get is precisely the degree of k um, adjoined p over k. That's the number of new points we get. And um, the points we get, I'll, I'll write them as z sigma, q sigma. And they'll again be on this uniformization I had on the previous image. This is just the pre-image of the uniformization restricted to the fundamental domain. <clears throat> and as above the Q sigma here will be rational um, of, of heights big O of N, and, but Z sigma will in general just be something we can't say much about. It'll probably be transcendental. And so the basic point of the strategy is we, we have to, to get the Galois orbit lower bound. So that's one step in the strategy. We have to find out how does this degree here grow in function of the order? It's kind of the basic step here. And so let me take a step back and go back to um, just um, roots of unity, which is in some way the, 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 the base case here, the model case here. So a root of unity, I can also think of as a torsion point on some algebraic group, maybe the, just the, the multiplicative group here, GM. And any torsion, any root of unity is also as an order n. And uh, we know how to compute the, the degree of a root of unity over Q. That's just given by the Euler function evaluated at the order. This is Euler's torsion function, and we can compute that. That's just n times that we look at the product over all prime numbers dividing n. And then I take as a factor one minus one over P, which is going to be close to one if P is very large. So what we're interested in is a lower bound for this degree. And so the trick here is quite simple. I can write n as square root of n times square root of n. And so one square root of n here is here. And I take the other square root of n and I just replace every power of p by just p to the one that appears in n. So I can bound this expression here from below by square root of n times the product of the primes, prime divisors of n where each factor is square root of p times one minus one over p. Right? And so that now this is just some basic fact from analysis that this expression here will be at least one if p is at least three, something you can compute by hand. So this contribution will almost always be at least one. And so we can just bound it, forget about it. So there's a small problem for p equals two, but then uh, um, something like one over square root of two or something. So this is a basic calculation. And what it tells us is that the degree over Q grows at least like the square root of N over two. So it grows at least um, polynomially with some, some exponent as N goes to infinity. Now, usually in this method, we need something similar for abelian varieties. And the problem is that um, getting lower bounds of this nature for abelian varieties is, is a more delicate affair. So there's no a nice formula, um, except in some um, some cases, but in general, there's no nice formula for this degree in terms of some function that we can readily compute and bound from below. And so the the, the basic technique that we can use here is 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 um, this deep work of of Master and Sinu David in transcendence theory that gives us lower bounds for these degrees, which I'll come through in a moment. And now I'd also be um, mentioned some more recent work by uh, Harry Schmidt, the postdoc in Basel, who um, has a different approach to these, uh, to these kind of lower bounds. And this was then also generalized in, in work by uh, Benjamini and, and Jaffa and, and Schmidt um, to replace what is sometimes called the master Wüstholz isogeny estimates. And this had an, a big effect on um, the Andreor conjecture for general Schumer varieties. That's a different topic. So there's a different approach here to lower bounds that I'd like to mention. But the, the approach that we use in, in the work with, with Xiang is, um, well, the theorem of Sinu David, um, which is kind of rooted in transcendence theory. And recall that for the roots of unity, we had a lower bound of the nature degrees at least square root of n over two. <clears throat> But for abelian varieties, we get something similar. So here, A is an abelian variety um, defined over some number field. 
And P is a point of order N in this, um, uh, in this setup. And then the lower bound that Sinu David gets, which generalizes older work, is that it, the, the degree grows like some small power or some power of N where delta is just a, a real number depending on the genus positive. The difference here is that downstairs in this denominator, we also get a contribution on the so-called faulting site of the abelian variety A. So the faulting site is something that um, works against us in this, in, in this step because uh, as it increases, um, well, the lower bound gets worse and worse. And the, the issue with this so-called relative one month problem that um, we're dealing with is that, well, the Bellian variety is moving in a family. And so this faulting site will also be not moving. And as soon as you move in a family, the height will generally be, can become large. And so that's something you have to worry about because if this height becomes large, then this lower bound will become less and less uh, useful. So we need some kind of control on this faulting height, which I'm not gonna um, have time to describe in my talk, but you can think of it as, um, I, I briefly explained what the height of a, of a rational vector is. So a Nibelian variety is just, um, well, it's some sub variety. You can realize it as some sub variety of uh, a projective space. And as such, it's defined by homogeneous polynomials, a finite number of homogeneous polynomials with coefficients in some number field. And the faulting height is in a sense related to the height of the um, polynomials, um, a nicely chosen set of polynomials that cut out your abelian varieties, roughly speaking. So that's kind of the faulting site, I guess, the, 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 to summarize, it depends on the coefficients defining um, polynomials um, that cut out your abelian variety. But if we can get rid of the faulting site, then we could get a lower bound for this degree that just grows like in the uh, multiplicative case. <clears throat> and this is actually what works in the one-dimensional setting. So this is what Master and Zani use. They use a result of Silverman that says that if, if um, we have a curve and um, there's this non kind of um, general position condition that the curve is not generically torsion. So not all points are automatically torsion. Then uh, if I have a torsion point on the curve, then this is enough to conclude that the faulting site is, is bounded. So this was formulated in a slightly different manner, this result, but this is what um, it essentially boils down to. Now with the higher dimensional case, um, <clears throat> this is where we use uh, results by Dimitrov, Gab, myself, that was published last year. And instead of non-torsion, non-generically torsion, we have a, a different condition, which is non-degenerate and reflects the fact that more things can go wrong in higher dimension. So um, if you take this adjective non-degenerate, then essentially the theorem says that, well, um, if I'm on a poor, if, if I have a torsion point like here on my X, and it's, um, then its height is bounded by some parameter B except possibly on something, um, some subset of positive co-dimension, which we can forget. <clears throat> okay, so maybe I'll skip this um, definition of uh, non-degenerate. In a sense, this generalizes uh, from the one-dimensional case, um, the non-coercion condition, and um, I'll come to that maybe later if there are questions about it. Maybe just some, just to give you a, a hint of what 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 it means in extreme cases. Uh, if if you're inside a fixed abelian variety, then everything is is non-degenerate. So all sub varieties are are good good enough for the theorem to apply. But that's not the case we're interested. In. We're actually interested in the case where we are not in a fixed abelian variety, but we're in a family. If we're in a family of abelian varieties and the tor and, and x is somehow well, H, every, every X is, is generically torsion, so every point on X is, is going to be a finite order, then X will be degenerate. So this is the other extreme case that we have to rule out in order to um, 
to get any reasonable kind of height bound. So this degenerate somehow lies between, non-degenerate this um, lies between these two. So the, the upshot of, of the whole thing is that if, if we have a non-degenerate subvariety of our universal family, then the faulting's height uh, of, that means I have five more minutes, the faulting side here will be bounded. And um, then we can use Sinu David's result, which will tell, give us a lower bound here for the, the degree that grows polynomially or like a small, small, some small power of the order of the point. Now we go back to the original setup of the theorem. Namely, remember we had a single point and we used the Gallup group to construct new points and then we looked at what happens in the, in the covering upstairs. So for a fixed point P, we get at least N to some delta points in, um, in this definable set, X tilde, and N is just the order of P. And this rational, this is Q sigma, this was a rational point, a rational vector in, in Q to the 2G. So this is kind of the situation where you would want to apply um, the Pilo-Wilkie counting theorem. We have to be a bit careful because for Pilo-Wilkie, the, the full vector has to be rational, but here in this application, only part of the vector is rational. As remember, this may be transcendental. Um, so we need the variant of this, um, this result. And the variant is, uh, this was, uh, proved by uh, Jonathan Pila and myself a few years ago. It's essentially just an application of, of Pila's block version of uh, the pila wilkie counting theorem. So you can't say that there exists a semi-algebraic arc um, in X tilde, but there exists an arc where the coordinates that happen to be rational, those uh, that arc on those coordinates will be semi-algebraic. And on the other coordinates, these are the somehow the transcendental coordinates, if you will. Um, the, we can't say much about the uh, the arc, except that it's uh, it's a non-constant constant arc, right? So this is somehow the what the what the machinery gives if we just assume that a certain portion of the coordinates is is rational and a certain other portion of the coordinates is not rational. So this is a, at this stage, if you look at the Pila Wilkie, uh, sorry, the Pila Zanya paper on Bonnie Montfort, this is where they um, they use some kind of variant of the um, Axe-Shanwell functional transcendence result where they actually prove it themselves, again, using the Pila-Wilkie counting theorem. So they, it's, the theorem is, is used twice in their paper. And in fact, we also need here um, a version of, um, of Shanwell's theorem. <clears throat> Let me just give you a very brief history of the results that led up to the one that um, we use in our paper, so um, we, we need it in a, in a somehow in a modular setting. So there was work, Pila and Zimmerman, who proved uh, Max Shadowell for this, um, I think maybe it was Y1 to the end and not Y2 to the end, but for a product of modular curves. Um, it was worked by Klingler, Ilmo, and Yafaev um, going in this direction in, for, for Shimura varieties, the so so-called Ax Lindemann Weierstrass theorem. They resolved. And um, <clears throat> then for um, the Shimura varieties we're working with, AG, this is, um, well, this is the base of the thing we're working with. This was proved by Moth, Pila, and Zimmerman in 2019. And the version that we need is due to Ziyang Gao, who has the correct analog for the um, Akshanual theorem, at least the one that we need for the universal family of the Bell and Bryce, AG. So roughly speaking, what, what it means in our setting is that remember that we had a point um, on X that is torsion as some finite order N. And if the order N is large enough, then we have a large Gal orbit that grows like some N to the delta asymptotically at least. <clears throat> and then the, the pila wilkie vari variant will produce an arc that is semi-algebraic and at least partially part of the coordinates and, and not, not semi-algebraic necessarily on the other part. And that's where we, we use the, the mixed weak act shadow theorem. And the, the upshot of the whole thing is essentially the following, 
So we, we started out with our X, which lies here in this universal family. This, this notation just means that, um, well, X may not cover the full base, but it will cover some portion of the base. And Galois' result essentially gives us a morphism from, from this universal family to some lower dimensional family. So G prime has dimensions strictly less than G. This is what we get out of, um, of that application. And in addition, if you look at the image of X under this lower dimensional projection, the, if you, I have it down here, the dimension of, of the image of X on the Psi will be strictly less than G prime. Now G prime is the relative dimension here on the target. So this brings us back into a situation where we can hope to, to actually prove a relative money Munford type situation. But now the advantage is that we're in, in a lesser dimension. So we've, we've gone effectively gone down at least one dimension and that's kind of where the induction then um, kicks in. So uh, that's just, this is my final slide and it's essentially the same thing I had in the slide before. So we start out with our X. <clears throat> If M is sufficient, if the torsion order is sufficient, if there's a risky dense set of torsion points, then we can map the whole thing down into some lower dimensional thing. And this morphism here, it's it fiber-wise, it respects the, the group structure. So torsion points will be mapped to torsion points. And then we get a risky dense set of torsion points here in this image. And then we can try to use an induction and get the theorem for, for X itself on the original space. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Thank you.